My name is Mark Stilley, and we're going to cover the Japanese plan and the planning behind it. Uh, I'm going to go for about an hour, no more. Here's what we're going to cover today in the golden hour. We've got to talk about the man behind the Pearl Harbor attack, because without this guy, the attack simply would not have occurred. We're going to look at the, uh, the ordeal he went through to get the plan approved. It was by no means assured that the plan was going to even be approved by the Japanese command uh, authorities. We'll look at the weapons he had at his disposal. Then we'll look at the plan in some detail, but not too much detail. And finally, at the end, we'll look at uh, how good the plan was or wasn't. All right, starting off with uh, the main player in this drama, this drama, uh, Fleet Admiral Yamamoto Isoruku. Uh, like I said, it, it's simply inconceivable that without Yamamoto, this, this attack would ever have occurred. Uh, he fought against uh, somewhat long odds to get this thing approved, and he was the driving force behind the attack. So his background, briefly, uh, born in northern Japan, in a, in a, uh, in a poverty-stricken circumstance, he desired to go to the Japanese Naval Academy. He was the top applicant in all of Japan to get into the Naval Academy, which he attended in 1901. And he got out in 1905, just in time to be assigned to a cruiser, which was part of the climactic battle of the Russo-Japanese War, the Battle of Tsushima. He took part in the battle. He was wounded during the battle. He was commended for his courage, and he was uh, clearly a man on the rise at that time. He was sent to the U.S. in 1919 to study at Harvard and to roam around the country, get a feel for the U.S. And here's where he began to uh, accrue his understanding of the U.S. and its war-making potential. It's also where the myth begins that he had these unique insights into America and the American psyche. Uh, early in his career, he became an air power advocate. He was never, though, a radical air power advocate like others were in the Imperial Navy. He returned to America as a naval attache in 1926, stayed there for over two years. Uh, that was the, his second and last uh, tenure in the U.S. Uh, he did come back to the fleet and took command of a very important naval aviation billet, uh, command of the carrier Akagi. That was the first Japanese fleet carrier, so he was an important figure in Japanese naval aviation uh, early in his career. Uh, then his, uh, his, his career took a plot twist. Uh, because he was familiar with the West, he spoke English fairly well. He was assigned to be part of the delegation at the first London Naval Conference in 1930. Then he returned to the fleet. You can see that he had uh, two more important billets, uh, two more important naval aviation billets, uh, which took him up to 1934, when his career took another even more uh, serious uh, twist when he became a political admiral. He was assigned as the chief delegate at the second London Naval Conference. Uh, he did not want any part of this job. He didn't think he was up to it. And he had a very, a very difficult job because uh, he was part of the so-called treaty faction in the Imperial Navy, which thought it was uh, with Japan's interest and the Navy's interest to keep Japan in the interwar uh, naval restriction treaty system. Uh, but the government at this time did not share that view. Uh, the the so-called fleet faction, which wanted to get out of the treaty restrictions, uh, held sway. So he had the job of, uh, of getting Japan out of the naval treaty system, but not appearing to make Japan look like the culprit that was undermining the entire system. But he did this. He came off very well to Western observers. He was obviously a very intelligent uh, uh, man, and he seemed somewhat open to Western ideas and Western points of views. Came back to the fleet uh, briefly uh, as the chief of the aeronautics uh, department, again, a naval aviation billet of some importance. And then he uh, resumed his uh, political career, if you will, in the Navy. He was uh, named as the vice Navy minister. By tradition in the Japanese Navy, the vice Navy minister and the Navy minister are the only officers which are allowed to take part in politics. Uh, which he did throughout his almost three-year tour in this job. Towards the end of, the, of, of, this, of his tenure there, it was apparent that the hardliners in Japan were, were in control. Uh, he was, uh, Yamato was in fact a moderate. Uh, uh, so towards the end of his tenure, it was, it was seen wise to get him uh, out of Tokyo, and that's why he was given command of the, of the combined fleet. Uh, which was somewhat of a surprise because he, he didn't have a lot of sea time. He wasn't a, a sea dog like other admirals were, uh, but he was given command of the combined fleet. The combined fleet is the most important seagoing job in the Imperial Navy. It combines all the important elements 
in the Japanese Navy. Uh, all the important seagoing elements, land-based air force, the submarines, uh, all under the combined fleet. And at that point, fairly early on in 1940, as we'll see, uh, he, he begins to think about how, the, how Japan should go to war with the U.S. if they're forced to do so, and he becomes the driving force behind the Pearl Harbor attack, as we're going to talk about. Just to finish up with his career, uh, I don't understand why, uh, because everything he touched, he bungled, and, but he's still seen as a, as a national hero in Japan to this date. Uh, Midway was a, a second attempt by Yamamoto to uh, create a decisive battle with the U.S. Navy, and uh, the attack was not well thought out. He misallocated uh, forces in the attack, and it did not go well, to say the least. So, major Japanese defeat. At that point, uh, the Americans seized the initiative, and they landed in this place called Guadalcanal, the Southern Solomons, in August 1942. Uh, Japanese are slow to respond. Uh, even at this point in the war, the Japanese Navy outnumbered the U.S. Navy by a considerable amount. Uh, Yamamoto never brought this superiority to bear. Uh, the Japanese fight a six-month battle of attrition in the Solomons, and they lose that. Uh, and ironically enough, then, uh, aircraft from Guadalcanal are used to shoot down and kill Yamamoto in April 1943. So he's killed before Japan is defeated, so I think that's why he's still a, still a national hero. He was not tainted by total defeat, and there's this myth that surrounds him still that he did not want to go to war with the U.S. Before we talk about the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, we have to look at the strategic uh, setting which uh, surrounds the attack. As you all know, in 1937, Japan uh, invades China. By 1940, they're bogged down in a war in China with no prospects of victory. Uh, 1940, the U.S. does start to ratchet up the economic pressure on the Japanese. Uh, this comes to a head in July 1941, when the Americans, uh, when the Japanese are, are set to take control of, uh, of French Indochina, and at that point, the U.S. slaps a total trade embargo on Japan. This is not your, your typical trade embargo, it's a crippling trade embargo, because you, as you see there on that slide, Japan gets uh, almost all of its oil from foreign sources, and most of that comes from the U.S. So at this point, Japan's faced with a very uh, serious dilemma. They can either give in to the U.S., which is impossible because the price of doing so would, would be to get out of China, which they're not prepared to do, or they can fight their way out of this dilemma and seize resources necessary to uh, alleviate the effects of the, of the embargo. So that means moving south taking the Dutch East Indies and British <coughs> Malaya and those southern resource areas. But the problem, though, in the, in the Japanese mind is that uh, the Dutch and the British and the Americans are all linked together strategically. And if you attack the Dutch and the British, then that draws the Americans into the war as well. So uh, that means that uh, an attack on the U.S. is also necessary. So just to look at Japanese strategy at this point, it's, it's rather, rather befuddling how they get to this point. But their way out of this dilemma is uh, to attack the world's strongest nation and the world's biggest empire, and they're still bogged down in China. And oh, by the way, during this entire time, the Japanese army wants to go north and attack Russia as well. So here's how they hope to, to solve the problem. They did have a naval strategy in place, and we're going to hear more about that later on today in a lot more detail. Uh, but the naval strategy uh, against the U.S. had been carefully thought out, carefully choreographed over a period of more than a decade. Uh, it, it, it's not so much a strategy as it is a reliance on a decisive battle, just like what happened in the Russo-Japanese War when Yamamoto fought at Tsushima. So th this war with the U.S. will unfold in, in general terms uh, as follows that the Japanese will seize the Philippines. They're largely unguarded, so that won't be a problem. And then the U.S. will move to, uh, to counterattack, to reoccupy the Philippines. And at that point, the two navies come into contact. There's going to be a decisive battle somewhere in the Western Pacific. Uh, since the Japanese Navy is smaller than the U.S. Navy, that's by the treaty restrictions from the interwar treaties, uh, the Japanese have to come up with a way to attrit the U.S. Navy before this, this battle. They're going to do so with submarines, long-range aircraft, and uh, light torpedo attacks by destroyers and heavy cruisers just to bring the battle down to a, a manageable level. And of course, at that point, the battleships uh, meet in this climactic uh, battle. 
Japanese, of course, are better trained than us, and they have longer range weapons, and they, they expect to defeat the U.S. battle line. In this, uh, in this operation, the Japanese carriers do have a role. Uh, they're not going to operate in a, in a massed force like they will at Pearl Harbor, as we'll see, uh, and, and their role is secondary to that of the battleships. But this is the, the outline of a, a, a Japanese pre-war naval strategy. And Yamamoto does not have much uh, tolerance for this passive strategy. He, he has a much more aggressive strategy in mind. Uh, at the same time as Yamamoto was already thinking about the possibility of a Pearl Harbor operation, in May 1940, the Pacific Fleet is moved permanently from the West Coast to Hawaii by President Roosevelt as a deterrent to Japanese aggression. So uh, this certainly gives Yamamoto reason to think there's an opportunity here to, to inflict what he believes is necessary to bring the war to a successful conclusion. And that is uh, an initial blow that's so shattering uh, and so powerful that it, it uh, will cripple American morale and bring us to the table sooner rather than later. So this becomes the driving rationale for the Pearl Harbor attack. So uh, he's not the first guy to think about attacking Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is a staple in, uh, at American and Japanese war colleges before the war. Uh, and in fact, late in the 20s, Captain Yamamoto talked about how he would attack Pearl Harbor. And on a couple of occasions during the U.S. Uh, annual naval maneuvers, they'd actually use carriers in a surprise attack against Pearl Harbor. So it, it was shown to be not just uh, possible theoretically, but it actually been done before. Uh, and as, uh, if you read the record uh, of Yamamoto's thinking on this, as early as March and April of 1940, he's already talking about the possibility of striking Pearl Harbor with his chief of staff and the, and the combined fleet. And in the fall, he, he starts to get serious about this and he directs an Admiral Onishi, who's a fellow air power advocate and known as a very clever planner, uh, to study this Pearl Harbor attack. But, but later, uh, at, after the attack had been conducted, uh, he writes a letter to an admiral buddy of his and says that he had decided to attack Pearl Harbor as early as December 1940. So uh, that's, that's incredible when you think about it. And uh, he's known as a bold gambler and, uh, by reputation. He loved to gamble, apparently, and he was a bold gambler. But this, to me, appears to be reckless. Uh, in December 1940, the Japanese couldn't even refuel a fleet to get it to Pearl Harbor. They had no way of gaining surprise. They, they hadn't thought this through. They, they didn't know if they could get surprise at Pearl Harbor. No surprise the attack was, was not going to succeed. They didn't even have weapons that could be used against the fleet at Pearl Harbor. And, and they hadn't really thought through the cost benefits of the attack at all. But, but he apparently in December had already made up his mind he was going to attack Pearl Harbor. He, in a letter in early January, tells Anishi to get hot on this and study the proposed attack. Uh, they meet later in the month, and Yamamoto uh, explains his vision to Anishi, and he wants a, a draft plan in the near term. To do that, Onishi pulls in uh, a commander, Genda, who's known as a, he, he's an air power <coughs> advocate, known as a brilliant planner. Genda's the guy on that, in the top right uh, on that slide. So, so Genda quickly surveys the situation. He comes up with nine principles that he thinks will be necessary to make the attack successful. Uh, and these nine principles pretty much survive intact throughout the entire planning process. So after Yamamoto, Genda becomes the most important uh, driving figure in the whole Pearl Harbor uh, attack process. Uh, so he gives this plan to Yamamoto, this draft plan, in early March. And at that point, Onishi kind of drops out of it, and he later becomes a, a doubter that the plan will, will even succeed. Uh, then April, Yamamoto has to take this plan to his superior. His superior officers are in the Naval General Staff. <coughs> They're the guys responsible for, for, for formulating Japanese naval strategy. Uh, as soon as they see this plan, they think it's too risky, and they have a number of reasons that we'll talk about later why this thing is too risky. But more importantly, they want the carriers that Yamamoto 
wants to take to Pearl Harbor, uh, they need these carriers, they believe, to go uh, support the southern attack, to gain the vital resources. And of course, that's th the reason why Japan's going to war. So this doesn't, uh, it doesn't fare well at, at, at first glance with the Naval General Staff. In late April, as we'll see, uh, the Japanese form an entity called the First Air Fleet when they pull together all the fleet carriers into one operational entity. Uh, this gives them the capability to attack Pearl Harbor, the actual striking power to do so. It also gives them a, a large planning cell to look at the plan in detail, which they start to do. Genda is assigned to the First Air Fleet. He still is the driving force behind this. Uh, his bosses are now drawn into it as well. Uh, Vice Admiral Nagumo is the commander of this force. Uh, he and his chief of staff both think the attack is reckless and they doubt it will succeed. So again, uh, more opposition because the, the people actually entrusted by Yamamoto to conduct the attack both think it's a bad idea. All right, the debate continues throughout the summer as it becomes more and more likely that Japan and the U.S. will be going to war, uh, possibly in the near term. Uh, in broad brush turns, the Japanese needed to go to war if they were to do so in December because that would give the army uh, the chance to seize the southern areas before the monsoon season in the spring. So the clock is ticking. So 7 August, uh, the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet uh, goes to the Naval General Staff again and presents the plan. And again, the, the, the read from the Naval General Staff is that this is way too risky and the reasons are shown there. Uh, there, are, there are serious and real doubts about how the plan would be conducted successfully. Uh, refueling has not been solved. You can't get the fleet there. Weapons are not developed yet or in place to allow the attack to occur. And surprise is still very much in doubt. So with these serious issues, uh, the Naval General Staff rejects the plan. They, they do agree, though, to look at it uh, later in the summer as they really do have to finalize the first phase operations in the upcoming war. So in September, there's a so-called war game conducted uh, by the combined fleet, and, and by the Naval General Staff actually, uh, looking at the entire first phase naval operations, but to include looking at the Pearl Harbor operation. And it's, this, it's a misnomer to call this a war game, as you'll, as you'll see it called in various, various books or, or TV shows. It's more like a, a staff exercise where the Japanese can, can change the variables in the plan to see if it's viable or not. We do the same things. So it, it's, uh, they, they run through the plan twice uh, in September. Uh, the first time, uh, the Japanese uh, do not gain uh, surprise for various reasons, and the, the attack is a, is, a, is a massive failure. The second time they run this through, they change the variables. Uh, and justly so, uh, they, they changed the approach route of the Japanese uh, attack force. They gained surprise, and the attack is a massive success. So uh, this does show that the attack is feasible if the Japanese can gain surprise. In the meantime, though, uh, Yamamoto still hasn't even won over his own officers in the combined fleet. Uh, they have a tabletop exercise in the middle of October and after which the admirals present are given a chance to talk about the plan, and all but one of the admirals there still say it's a, it's, it's a bad idea, it's too risky. Uh, at that point, Yamato has had enough of this, and he, he tells his assembled uh, officers, his commanders there, that as long as he's in charge, the operation will go forward. So at least that ends the debate on the combined fleet side. But here it is, October, and we're going to a uh, war as early as early December, and we still don't have this nailed down or not. So Yamamoto brings to a head whether or not this, uh, this plan will be supported by the Naval General Staff. This occurs in the middle of October. Uh, he sends Admiral Kusaka first to read the Naval General Staff. He's rebuffed for the same arguments. It's too risky. Uh, and then uh, Yamamoto plays his ace card he sends back uh, Captain Kurishima, his staff officer, with the, th the threat that if you, if you, the Naval General Staff, does not approve this plan, then the entire combined fleet and myself will resign. So he plays that threat, and that does change the whole tenor of the debate. The Japanese can't imagine going to war without Yamamoto at the helm of the combined fleet. So the plan's approved. And more so than that, uh, 
Yamato gets his desired force allocation uh, because all six fleet carriers are assigned to the Pearl Harbor Task Force. So late in the whole planning process, the plan's approved uh, with the full weight of the first air fleet uh, associated with it. Okay, we'll look uh, at the weapons now that Japanese had at their disposal. Uh, we've been talking about this first air fleet, uh, also known as the, as the striking force, the, the tactical element known as the striking force, Kaido Butai, as you'll see perhaps in, uh, in some books or, or you hear on TV shows. Uh, Kaido Butai combines uh, three carry divisions into a single operational entity. This is, uh, this is a revolution in naval affairs, if you will. Uh, it's, it's, it's unparalleled striking power uh, assigned to a single operational commander. Uh, six carriers bring 400, over 400 aircraft to the fight, uh, manned by highly trained air crews. So here's, the, here's a weapon with which they can conduct a massive attack like Yamato has in mind. Uh, there are six carriers assigned to the first air fleet. Uh, each of these has uh, an air group which is uh, comprised of three squadrons. You can see there the various types of fighter squadron to gain air superiority and to protect the fleet against possible American counterattack. Uh, a bomber squadron, which uh, is a, actually uh, comprised of dive bombers, and a, an attack squadron, as they call it, which is uh, comprised of carrier attack aircraft, which can act as torpedo bombers or as level bombers. This is pretty much the same uh, way that US carrier air groups are arranged. So this is a very capable force, is, is the bottom line. Looking at these in a bit more detail, the first carry division, uh, which was in fact uh, Yamamoto's old command, he had the command of this division, also the flagship, uh, Akagi. So these are the two largest carriers in this, uh, in this fleet. Uh, Akagi is a converted battle, a converted battle cruiser. Kaga is a converted battleship. Uh, and they could carry, as you see, a, a large strike uh, group. Second carry division, uh, these uh, two carriers were the first designed from the keel up, Japanese fleet carriers. Uh, they're actually light fleet carriers, they're not well protected, uh, but they are very fast and they do carry a, a rather useful air group, as you see there. Uh, Carrier Division 5 was a late add to the plan. Uh, these were com commissioned, these two ships, in August and September, so they were just put in service in time to take part in the attack. Shokaku and Zukaku were the best carriers in the world at this time. Uh, very fast ship, long endurance, uh, well protected, well armed, and you can see they carried a, a very large strike group. So in 1941, these were the, the two best carriers of any Navy. The problem was, though, because they were New carriers, their air groups were also new and therefore inexperienced. So uh, the planners for the attack didn't trust these aviators to take on the key targets. Uh, so they were used against secondary targets during the attack. Uh, looking at the aircraft, uh, these were, were state-of-the-art aircraft. There were three principal types. We've all heard probably of the Type Zero fighter, the Zero fighter, as the Americans called it later in the war. Uh, it was the best uh, carrier-based uh, fighter uh, at this time in the world. Uh, fairly well armed, uh, good top speed, but most of all, it was a supremely uh, competent dogfighter. It was simply better than the other American fighters at Pearl Harbor. The dive bombers, uh, the Type 99, as the Japanese called them, uh, this is also a capable aircraft. If you've seen it, you can't really tell in that picture right there. It has fixed landing gear. And in fact, the uh, Type 99 accounted for more Allied ships than any other Japanese aircraft during the war. So uh, a capable aircraft. The problem was, though, that it carried a rather light bomb load, a 551-pound bomb. So a bomb that size is not going to be able to penetrate thick battleship armor. So useful against lightly, more lightly armed armored ships uh, to include carriers and, and cruisers, but not battleships. Uh, the most important attack uh, aircraft in the operation was this Type 97. Actually, it's a carrier attack plane, not a torpedo plane, but it could operate in both a torpedo role and a horizontal bombing role. It carried a, a large payload there, you can see, uh, a 1,700-pound uh, payload. 
It carried the Type 91 aerial torpedo, which was a very reliable, very capable torpedo. Uh, the U.S. at this time did not have a reliable aircraft launch torpedo. The Japanese did, and this was a formidable ship-killing system. All right, there was still, uh, even though the plan was eventually approved by the Naval General Staff, the, there were still some technical planning issues that they had to uh, come to grips with before the attack was viable. And we'll mention a, a few of these here now. Uh, the biggest one was surprise. Uh, uh, the first people to look at this, Onishi and Genda, quickly identified that without surprise, the attack would be impossible. Pearl Harbor was thought to be uh, a very well, as it was actually, it was a very well defended facility. Uh, with hundreds of U.S. aircraft on the island and the entire Pacific Fleet. So if you don't gain surprise, it's unlikely that a, a small force, even as powerful as the first air fleet was, it, it was unlikely that it could be completely successful in an attack uh, against Pearl Harbor. So they looked at several ways to gain surprise. The principal uh, question was from what, uh, from what uh, area do they approach Pearl Harbor from? Uh, they, they would like to do it from the south or from the west because that's a more direct route and that had, a, that had much less stringent fuel requirements. If you recall, they still haven't worked out the fueling problem yet, uh, but, but that would mean there's a, a minimal U.S. air reconnaissance to the north. And in fact, they were right. They decided to go through the North Pacific uh, in the winter, which is a, is a, it's a rough go. It's a much longer route. Had to refuel several times in route but that meant that there was a great likelihood they would gain surprise. So that's the route that was finally uh, approved. After they did these so-called war games and they ran it through their staff exercises, it was apparent that they had to choose the northern route to gain surprise. Uh, further, to gain tactical surprise, they, they planned this attack to occur on a Sunday and on the morning of a Sunday for two reasons. The Americans would be less prepared on a Sunday morning which was true, in fact, and, uh, and the, the, the pattern of the fleet uh, operations meant that most ships would be in port on a Sunday morning. So that, that, that's why they chose to come from the north and to do it on a Sunday morning. It seems rather mundane to talk about this, but it, you know, given how navies operate today, navies operate on a global basis, some, some navies do, and they refuel all the time. But uh, though Japan was a modern navy and, a, and, a, and a, a major navy, in 1941, they didn't have a lot of experience with refueling at sea. And that was a problem because of the 20 combatant ships assigned to the force, only seven of these could reach Pearl Harbor without refueling. So that means they had to solve this problem. Uh, Kusaka, who's the chief of staff of the First Air Fleet, he took this on himself to figure out uh, it really wasn't uh, you know, that hard to do once they put their mind to it. There were three carriers that didn't have the radius to get to Pearl Harbor. So these three carriers received uh, a bunch of extra fuel on drums throughout the ship to get them there and back. And then Kusaka got eight oilers assigned to the fleet. And these eight oilers and the fleet did extensive refueling exercises throughout November and uh, they finally did feel comfortable late in the planning process that they could solve this refueling problem. Had a problem too with the torpedoes uh, that they had to use in Pearl Harbor because if you recall the, the whole goal of the operation is to cripple U.S. naval power, shock American morale. Well how do you do that? You, you sink the, the centerpiece of a navy which at that time was still the battleship in the minds of, of most naval observers. So you can't sink battleships with bombs for the most part. You gotta sink them with uh, torpedoes. So the problem was a Type 91 torpedo is a nice torpedo, but uh, the depth of the harbor was something around 40 feet. And when you drop a heavy object like a torpedo from an aircraft from its typical drop altitude, it sinks much deeper than 40 feet. So they had to solve this problem so they wouldn't uh, end up in the mud of Pearl Harbor. Uh, what they did was they put a uh, a set of wooden extension fins on the back of the torpedo which stabilized it in flight which meant that it didn't go as deep when it hit the water. 
Uh, even this, though, didn't work uh, entirely well. There were still problems when they had some dress rehearsals in November. They had to figure out uh, tactics to ensure the torpedoes were viable. Genda talked to this guy, Lieutenant Commander Murata, who's the Japanese Navy's premier torpedo expert, and they come up with a different flight profile for the aircraft, which would make it less likely they would go deep. But this meant flying at 65 feet above the water at 100 knots. So that did solve the problem. But here you have your, your principal attack aircrafts flying 65 feet at 100 nautical mi 100, at 100 miles per hour, which makes them very vulnerable to possible countermeasures. So uh, they solved this problem uh, technically with the fins, and, the, and they, they practiced extensively using this new float pro flight profile to get the torpedoes to work. Uh, the last batch of torpedoes were not delivered until a couple of days before they left the attack. So it was a, it was a close run thing to get the torpedo problem solved. More problems though with bombs, we talked about the inability of dive bombers with their light bombs to uh, penetrate heavy battleship armor, heavy horizontal battleship armor. This was a problem because if you've seen any of these pictures of Pearl Harbor, uh, the American battleships were moored uh, along so-called uh, Battleship Row on the south, southern part of Fort Island there in the middle of the harbor. Uh, they're moored in pairs. So that means that the outboard battleships are vulnerable to torpedo attack, but the inboard battleships are not. So you don't want those uh, units to escape attack. So they have to come up with a bomb that's capable of, of destroying battleships. Uh, what they do is they convert some 16-inch battleship shells uh, two uh, armored piercing weapons, and if you drop these from a sufficient altitude, you have the, uh, the mass and the velocity to penetrate battleship armor. So this is what they do. They re-engineer re these, uh, these new shells, and they get them to the fleet in time. So that's solved a technical problem, uh, but then you have the problem of accuracy. It's uh, difficult to hit a target from 10,000 feet. E even as, as big as a battleship, it's still difficult to hit that. So. They had been hitting it at about uh, a 10% accuracy rate, which really doesn't get the job done. So what they do is they, uh, they work on a tactic where they're able to employ groups of aircraft. First it was 10, then later it was five aircraft, which would launch together at a, at a target, and that would increase the likelihood that you would gain a couple of hits from each group against the target. Also, they brought down their altitude to under 10,000 feet uh, of course, the lower you are, the more accurate you can be generally. So they came down to 10,000 feet, that, uh, under 10,000 feet. That still gave them the required velocity to punch through battleship armor. But again, by, by uh, extensive practice, they came up to about a 20 or so percent uh, accuracy rate with horizontal bombs, which is pretty good. All right, looking at the plan now, in a bit more detail, uh, you see here the, the priorities for the attack. Uh, airfields, that's obvious, you have to strike American airfields so you can gain your superiority and you can uh, uh, forestall any American counterattack against uh, your carriers, which are seen to be very vulnerable by the Japanese. Uh, after that, though, the real priority, aircraft carriers, battleships. After that, cruisers and other warships in the harbor, then merchant ships, port facilities, and land installations. So this attack is really meant to to cripple the heart of American naval power, which means battleships and aircraft carriers. To do this, they're gonna have two attack waves. Uh, they have two attack waves because uh, uh, when you arrange your strike, when you launch your aircraft, uh, it's only possible to get uh, half of the aircraft carrier's aircraft complement on the deck at once to launch it. So there are two deck loads required to get the entire air group up. That's why there are, there are two attack waves. At first, they'd hoped to, uh, in order to gain surprise, they were going to attack at dawn uh, before the Americans were, were ready to respond. Uh, but that wasn't possible because of these inexperienced uh, aviators with Carrier Division 5. So uh, with that, they were going to launch at about dawn, get over the target about 8 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, which still was, was hopefully good enough to gain surprise. So you get to a point 230 miles north of Oahu, and launch these two waves, and that's gonna do the trick. The first wave is the most important wave because 
This is when the Americans were going to be the least prepared. Uh, total surprise would be in play here. So that's when you can get your, your slow and vulnerable torpedo bombers into the harbor uh, to attack your primary targets, which are the aircraft carriers and the battleships. So that's the focal point of the first wave. They have 90 aircraft of these carrier attack planes uh, armed with torpedoes and bombs focused on the aircraft carriers and the battleships, which are all moored around Ford Island. Uh, so, th so this is how the attack will be judged or not, as successful or not, and how well these 90 aircraft do. Uh, other aircraft in the first wave, uh, primarily from the inexperienced uh, aviators in that, uh, from Zukaku and Shokaku, they're tasked to hit targets that don't move, like airfields, uh, and the fighters are assigned uh, to gain us priority, and then once having done that, to also support the attacks on U.S. airfields. Got to look at the torpedo bombers in more detail because that is uh, seen as the primary destructive agent in the entire attack. There are 40 torpedo planes which are used in this first wave, and they're divided into two groups. So these are the, the cream of the crop, the best aviators in the Imperial Air Force. Uh, 24 aircraft from Akagi and Kaga are tasked to hit Battleship Row. So these are going to come up from the south, uh, fly over the, the, the land mass near Hickam Field, come up from the south and attack in a long line ahead formation uh, and take on those outboard battleships in Battleship Row. Second section, 16 more aircraft. These are the ones from Huryu and Soryu. Uh, these are allocated against the ships which are anchored on the other side of Fort Island. And typically, when the carriers are in port, that's where they are anchored, on the other side of Fort Island. So they did allocate uh, a large percentage of their strike force against the carriers. The problem was they knew as early as early in the morning of 7 December that as of 6 December, there were no carriers present at Pearl Harbor. And it was unlikely anybody was going to show up in the middle of the night. So even though they knew this, they did not have a backup plan for the 16 aircraft coming against the carriers. And as you'll hear from the next speaker, that, that caused a lot of confusion during the actual attack. But even so, the Japanese, having solved their problems there with shallow water torpedoes and everything else, they, they expected a lot out of their torpedo bombers. They thought they would score 27 hits out of the 40, which would have been, would have been devastating. Horizontal bombers were the other important aspect of that first wave attack because they're tasked to finish off uh, the battleships. Fifty aircraft were assigned, Eight more aircraft dropping these heavy armor-piercing bombs than were dropping torpedoes. Uh, they're arranged into five aircraft groups so they can launch as a group. Uh, they're also assigned to come up from the south. They're going to fly along the length of battleship row uh, trying to work uh, to for maximum drop accuracy. The commander of this attack, the, the actual attack itself, the air group attacking was a commander for Cheetah, and he told these, these groups to make as many runs as you have to, to to get the most accurate drop as you can. Second wave was devoted primarily to mop up in the, in the naval base area. There were no uh, carrier attack planes here. They were seen as too vulnerable. Uh, to American anti-aircraft fire, so this is where the dive bombers would come into play. These were the elite air crew of carrier divisions one and two, and these were the best dive bomber pilots in the world at this time. 81 dive bombers, not all of them actually made the attack, but 81 dive bombers were allocated against naval targets. Uh, and if you recall that, that list there, uh, uh, that, that's important because there was a lot of confusion with the Japanese about what their, what their targets were going to be for the dive bombers on the day of the attack. They were told by First Air Fleet staff that their target was aircraft carriers. And that's even if the aircraft carriers were torpedoed and were already sunk at their moorings. Uh, they were to bomb the hulks just to make sure they couldn't even be salvaged. Uh, of course, there are, no, there are no aircraft carriers there, which they knew ahead of time. So that being the case, no carriers. Uh, dive bombers don't work against heavily armored battleships. The next priority target should have been cruisers. Uh, and, and that isn't the way it played out. And I think the next speaker will talk about that in a lot more detail. 
Other than that, the rest of the aircraft in the second wave were, were going to finish off uh, American air power at the various uh, air bases shown on the slide. Uh, another f forgotten aspect of the plan was the, the use of Japanese submarines. And we're all probably aware that there were midget submarines used in the attack. There were five of these that were instructed to go up the channel and attack the fleet inside Pearl Harbor. But the plan was much bigger than that. Uh, the Japanese put a lot of uh, effort and resources into to develop long-range submarines in the interwar period. Some of these were, had even been equipped with, with scout planes. It was a big part of their elaborate attrition scheme we, that we talked about briefly. Uh, so since there wouldn't be a decisive battle in the first days of the war, they were allocated to the Pearl Harbor plan. Uh, Twenty submarines were arranged in and around Oahu to pick off stragglers of the American fleet. So the thinking was, as the Americans flee Pearl Harbor to evade the air attack, they run into the subs, and the subs have a, have a field day picking off American naval ships. Uh, there are also five more fleet subs which were carrying the midget subs to a point just south of Pearl Harbor. And this was a, a, a very contentious part of the plan because the aviators, like Genda, did not want anything to, to get in the way of, their, their, of, of surprise, surprise being the all-important element of this attack. Uh, but Yamamoto uh, decided in, in his gambler frame of mind, the, attacks, the, the attack is already very risky, what's one more risk? So he allowed the submarines, the, the midget subs, to enter the harbor before the attack started so they'd be in place at 0800 when the air attack occurred. This was very potentially very dangerous because it would take them hours to get up the channel. These are very slow submarines. They go a couple of knots on their batteries. So it gave the Americans the possibility of detecting these submarines hours before the attack. And as we'll see, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the submarine attack was really a, a viewed as an important part of this plan. Uh, keep in mind that naval air power was untested. The Japanese didn't really know what was going to happen here uh, with uh, air attacks against the fleet in port. So the whole submarine plan was seen as a, as a backup uh, to the air attack. But just, just to wrap up the submarine story, uh, the midget subs were ineffective. And what's, what's more important, uh, so was the, the fleet submarine operation. Uh, I think uh, all told in the days after the battle, they accounted for three merchant ships. They never even attacked a single American warship in the Hawaiian Islands after the attack. All right, wrapping this up here, we're going to look at the plan uh, from a couple of perspectives and talk about how good it was or wasn't. <laughs> Uh, and, and of course, this is the heart of the matter. You know, what, was Pearl Harbor necessary and was it effective? Uh, from my perspective, from a military point of view, the attack was unnecessary. Uh, and that's because the, the Pacific Fleet had no ability to interfere with the Japanese invasion and occupation of the southern resource areas. Uh, they did not have the logistical capability. They had tankers, not very many, but they they didn't have the fleet train and the ability to project power that far across the Pacific. So they couldn't have, have tried even if they wanted to. And keep in mind that because the American fleet was split between the Pacific and the Atlantic, so there was no likelihood that the Americans would have used the Pacific, the Pacific fleet to, to move west and stop the Japanese attack in the south. But most of all, from a political standpoint, this was an incredibly ill-considered operation. Uh, Yamamoto's concept that if he could sink a few battleships, and he thought that if he could sink four battleships, that would be enough, his, his concept that by sinking battleships he would shatter American morale was obviously way off base. Uh, so so and, and any, any observer of the American, of the American mentality, as, as Yamamoto was supposed to have been, uh, sh should have been able to think this out better. So, the attack did not achieve its, its, its uh, desired results in this way. And in fact, it was kind of productive. It was viewed as a, a dastardly sneak attack, which of course it was, and that, that drove the Americans to pursue this war much more vigorously. It, it brought the Americans into the war uh, with, a, 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 with vengeance on their mind, which made it, of course, uh, a, a disaster for Japan of the first order. Operationally, 
The plan was also flawed. Uh, of course, you hear on TV shows that the attack on Pearl Harbor crippled the U.S. fleet. It, it annihilated the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor. This was patently untrue. There were some 80 ships of the fleet present on that day. 18 of them were sunk or damaged. And that's serious damage, but it didn't cripple the fleet. Uh, what it did cripple, though, it, it did, as it was meant to, it took out the heart of the American battleship force. So uh, of the eight battleships present, five were in fact sunk that day. So it did achieve that, that goal. But did that even matter? I mean, these were, these were battleships that the Japanese had just shown to be shockingly vulnerable to torpedo attack. These were battleships that were too slow to operate with a carrier force. And the Japanese just showed that the, that the war was going to be a carrier war, and these battleships had no part in that war. So uh, they did come back into service. All but three of the ships came back into service. Uh, but even so, these battleships never came back into frontline service. They were useful in a number of roles, but they were not frontline units. And the fleet was not crippled. The fleet, in a matter of only six months, was able to decisively defeat the first air fleet at Midway. So uh, the, the Pearl Harbor attack failed to cripple the American fleet. And I think the bigger picture also needs to be kept in mind. If you look there at that last bullet on the slide, the Japanese could have taken out, could have destroyed every <coughs> ship present at Pearl Harbor, and it wouldn't have mattered to the outcome of the war. Uh, there you see the, the American wartime naval production, which dwarfed the entire Japanese fleet at the start of the war and also their entire wartime production. So even had they dealt a much more serious blow to the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, which they should have given their, their power at their disposal, it just wouldn't have mattered. And tactically, uh, the next speaker is going to talk a lot more about this, so I won't get into it. Uh, but tactically, the, problem, the, the plan had a lot of problems. Uh, for instance, they gave us many opportunities they, they try to throw away surprise at every opportunity. Uh, the midget subs were detected more than four hours before the attack. The Americans weren't able to capitalize on this, on this uh, misadventure by the midget submarines. Uh, also, there were, there's pre-dawn reconnaissance flown by float planes from cruisers that was picked up by American radar, and the Americans also did not use that to their advantage. Uh, with what they had available, those 90 carrier attack planes with torpedoes and bombs and the dive bombers, they should have done a lot more damage to the American fleet uh, than they did, as you'll hear in the next, uh, the next uh, lecture. Uh, but overall, the, the tor torpedo bombers did perform pretty well. You have to give them credit there. Uh, they were, were responsible for sinking three of the, of the battleships. Uh, a fairly good performance. They could have done better, but they, they, they did accomplish you know, Yamato's primary goal. The horizontal bombers also did a pretty good job. Uh, they had about a 20 or so percent accuracy rate, and tragically, one of those bombs was a bomb that hit Arizona, which destroyed the ship and killed almost 1,200 Americans. So uh, the horizontal bombers were successful. The dive bombers, though, were, were very unsuccessful. They, they really had a very poor showing on that day for a number of reasons, as you'll hear next. Also, the fighter doctrine was faulty. Had the, er, had the Americans been able to put up some fighters before the Japanese showed up, they would have had an opportunity to uh, really disrupt the attack because many of these attack aircraft would have been unescorted. So the attack was seen as a, as a brilliant uh, attack, well executed, well planned, uh, and I hope that we've shown that the, the planning process was rather shambolic and the execution was, was also not, uh, was not flawless either. So, that does take about the entire hour. There's a few time, a few minutes for questions if you have any. Sir? You note that a lot of the debate with the Naval General Staff in the fall of 41 was the discussion about whether the plan would work or not, whether the tactical would work, and the chief tactical surprise. Was there anybody on the Naval General Staff who was saying it doesn't matter if it's going to work or not, it's a stupid idea? Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. It was a stupid idea. <laughs> so it wasn't their idea. But it's stupid because it was so risky. It's stupid because it took the carriers away from the primary objective. Uh, it's stupid because it, it didn't bring into play their carefully planned out decisive battle uh, concept. But even though it was stupid, the Naval General Staff never put their foot down. And Yamamoto bullied them into accepting the plan. He did the same thing in Midway. 
where he bullied the Naval General Staff to get his way. There was also another admiral on the Japanese Naval General Staff, and unfortunately I can't remember his name, but he ended up at the end of the war in charge of the Kamikaze Force. And he basically said at that time, all you're going to do, and excuse me, the euphemism, all you're going to do is piss off the Americans. And we are not, we, we shouldn't even deliver the attack. But at this point, Yamamoto had, had invested his prestige in this concept, and there was no stopping it. So, so I said that a prudent military planner would have taken every step necessary. Well, a prudent military planner would not allow the American air threat and naval threat in the Philippines to threaten their, their lines of communication to the newly to be conquered southern resource areas. But uh, an excellent planner would have seen a way to steer clear of getting the Americans in the war. And, and that's what Yamamoto failed to realize. And, and all Japanese planners, for that matter. Sir? Was the um, failure to attack the uh, oil fuel storage and uh, repair facilities, was it ever considered or was it dismissed because the overemphasis on big ship? That was, that's a myth. That's a myth that they were on the verge of launching a third attack or that Fuchida advocated for a third wave against these facilities. Uh, as you saw, it was way down on their priority list. These guys were steeped in the, in the traditional concepts of naval power, and that didn't mean hitting oil tanks. It meant sinking ships. So it was never seriously considered. Sir. My question is uh, what you might call magazine capacity. How much of their onboard munitions did they use for the two waves? How much would they have had left if they wanted to come back again? That's a good question. They had 100 of these shallow water torpedoes, and they used 40 for the first wave. But had they wanted to come back again, uh, Fuchida and Genda were going to do so, if, and, and this thinking was not well developed, but uh, they could not come back with the carrier attack aircraft. They were too vulnerable, as, as was shown in the later phases of the first wave. So what they were going to be, be left with were the dive bombers. And what's not realized is they only lost 29 aircraft during the, during the attack, but many, many were damaged. And there was a considerable percentage of the dive bomber force which would not have been available for a third wave. So even if they would have been, uh, would have thought seriously about attacking facilities, it would have been difficult to get the force back. It landed at 1300 or so in the afternoon and it's dark there at 1700, 1800 probably. Hard to get that force turned around, reloaded and, and plan a new attack. And, the, and, the, and the, it would have run into much more resistance uh, and it would have been much less powerful uh, manned with only fighters and dive bombers. So I, I think that that wasn't a problem, you know, for one more wave, but that was never really their intent. One thing to add is that the Japanese aircraft carriers were really designed for almost very short operation periods. Their magazines were sized to have three strike loads per aircraft. So if, you know, if the attack was one wave that each aircraft participated, that's one, that was one third of their munitions. Sir. Since we're speculating, <laughs> what do you think the outcome would have been had the first air fleet encountered Enterprise and Lexington on the way out? Well, that wouldn't have gone well. <laughs> uh, just no way around that for the Americans. I mean, obviously six carriers, and, and it's a whole different topic, and I guess we'll, we'll talk about Midway maybe in June, I don't know, but, uh, uh, but American carrier doctrine in many ways was deficient. Uh, the Japanese were the top of their game, and had they been able to locate these carriers, they would have made short work of them. Now, the, the, the Americans could have got a strike off in return, and damage or sunk a, a Japanese carrier, very possibly, but they, but, Anything that the Japanese would have spotted, they would have sunk. I don't know if FDR knew. He was a, he was a naval, a naval dilettante. I, I don't know his level of knowledge. Well, no, we, we had no idea that they were there. I mean, Enterprise was coming back from Midway, and she was close to Pearl Harbor. And thankfully, she... Well, I, I don't know if she was flying missions that day or not, uh, search missions. Maybe she was, but you're, you're, you're right. It's lucky she didn't find anything. 
Sir. Um, were the Japanese, once they found out the carriers weren't there, they attempted to look for our no. carriers? No. Nope. Uh, that would be, uh, and you can ask every speaker the same question, and you should, but that would be totally untrue. We were totally surprised. And as an intelligence officer of 35 years, uh, you, there are two components into making an assessment about your enemy, the capabilities and his intentions. And in both areas, we had no idea this was even possible. Capabilities-wise, the Japanese simply were not capable of doing this, right? I mean, they, in fact, they weren't until later, late in the planning process. And of course, th their intentions, in our view, were to strike the Philippines. What was McCarthy on November 27th ordered to be on alert? What was that? Uh, well, the, the, all the commands were given those orders to be on alert, at, at, as they were in Pearl Harbor as well. Right. So, were we expecting something? Yes, we were, but not in Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Thank you.